Hi, my name is Matthew Seligman, and in this video we'll be going over how to build and use Lottie animations in our future projects. This video is for my friends and fellow cohorts and mentors at Lighthouse Labs. To start, what is a Lottie animation? So right up here I've got a simple Lottie animation from a site called Lottie Files. It's a free site that is available for all of us to grab free animations or even collaborate and put our own animations in there. Now you might be wondering, why use a Lottie animation in the first place? Well, the difference between a Lottie animation and an image, for example, would be a raster image has pixels and a vector image is based on math and paths. So if I was to zoom in and make my file size really, really large, actually let's even make it even bigger. Okay, that's probably as big as it's allowing me to do. But I'm gonna open this image of the author and I apologize if the author doesn't like this, but we're going to zoom in and you see how it actually blurs. We can see that there's pixelation created from the image. This is because the image is a raster format. Now, if we scroll down and we look at the image that is presented or the image quality that is presented, you'll see that it's crystal clear. Every angle of it is not even a blur in sight. So this is vector. And the author has done all of the animations purely in vector. Now, you might be also wondering, how does it compare in file size? Well, if we scroll down, we can see that the file sizes are extremely small. And we've got the ability to put them in all sorts of applications. From HTML, WordPress, Elementor, which is part of uh, WordPress, uh, Webflow, uh, Apple products, um, Android products, uh, Figma, um, XD. Google products, which includes all of the Google workspace. So that means the Google Word, um, Excel, everything. Um, After Effects, which is what we'll be using, and even Visual Code, which is something I'll be looking into in the future, along with a lot of other options that we can use. Now, you also might be wondering, well, what is the file type? Well, let's copy it and find out. It's actually creating a JavaScript object notation file which includes all of the data that is actually needed. So the groups, the paths, these are all within the names of the file that they created. We'll get into that when we design it. It might look a little bit more complicated than it really is. But now you might be wondering, okay, we've got a nice little animation that pops up. Great. How do we control it? What's the uses of it? Well, let's go down here and click interactivity. The reason I brought up Lottie files is because they've got a lot of design built into their Lottie player. And their Lottie player is where it's at for your projects. Let's scroll down and see what happens. As soon as we scrolled, it actually understood the state of our scroll. So we can actually control the state with multiple factors. We can also install it through Yarn, NPM, CDN, and we can add it by just simply adding a simple component to our DOM. And it's very easy to configure because it's all customizable within the interactivity uh, script that they provided. So if we scroll down even further, we've got uh, sync with Lottie on scroll relative to the container. Now notice that as it's relative to the container, it doesn't scroll until we're actually past the top bar, the, the header. Now, this might be a problem. So they've got another example right here, which is with offset, which gives us the control to actually control the limit of when it hits, which is basically on the 30% of the, the container, which is a lot better in this case. Uh, we have segment control. So as it's gotten to a point, it can actually continuously animate. We've got play segments, where it can only loop through specific segments. Now think of this as a timeline. See, it's going through frames 18 to 36, and it's basically just looping through. Down here, we've got play segments on hover. When we mouse over it, it actually plays the animation through a certain segment. The segments are 36 through 72, and it loops. Once we've done, it stops, and it leaves it on frame 36. It's very powerful once we know how to use these power or these uh, animations. Sync animation with cursor position. As I scroll left and right, it actually understands. 
and it can give us a whole variety of effects. Now it might be not working perfectly because I jumped in here um, a little bit off of the canvas. I think that the separators are right around here, but if you had this full screen it would work perfectly fluid, like it would go in line with my mouse. Uh, so there are some small little subtleties that we have to be aware of if we're putting them in containers. Uh, sync animation with cursor, uh, horizontal movement. So if I same thing, go like this. Just like I said, it's a little bit offset because I think my mouse was outside of the container when it started. Uh, play animation on click. So if I just click the screen, so this might be an effect that we've actually clicked a button. And as soon as we click the button, it then makes this effect. Very powerful stuff. Uh, play animation on hover. Just hovering over the uh, area and it affects. Uh, toggle animation. I can click it, then I can click it, and it reverses. So maybe you have a toggle switch that's in uh, SVG format and you can control it. Uh, play animation while it's visible. So if it's actually in the visibility area, then it will load. Uh, play on hold. So if I leave my mouse there, then it plays. If I mouse off, it goes to reverse. So it's basically just taking the hold as the play animation. Um, there's a variety of different effects that we can go over, but the main things are the chaining, which we would love to get into down the road, but I think it's just starting right now. So Lottie interact, well, maybe don't skim this one. Play animation on hold, you just hold it. And if I hold it there, it pauses. And then if I mouse off, it just leaves it there. Um, the chaining though is a pretty interesting one. Now I apologize to the bird, but we're going to click it and it explodes. And then there's feathers. Now, this is three separate animations chained together. As soon as I clicked it, it, it was first looping the bird animation, which is what we see now. Then we clicked it on click. It created an explosion, which is what we see here. Then it creates the feathers, which is what we see after the explosion. So we can actually create three different Lottie animations and merge them after and build them into a interactivity for Lottie files. So just to show you how powerful this is, we are going to go over um, just back into Lottie files here. And uh, we're just going to go over free animations. And I'll just show you the, the creativity of what people can be creating for free. And these are all available for you at your convenience. Now, you might be like, Matt, that's, that's great, but I don't have any use for that. And I agree right now. I was thinking of Larry. I have been having trouble with my code. And when we started Lighthouse Labs, we got to week uh, one, day five. They told us about rubber duck debugging. Now they've got a mascot called Larry the Duck. They recommended that we beg, borrow, steal, buy, fabricate, or otherwise obtain a rubber duck. Now I thought, do I go and just beg someone for a rubber duck? Nah, don't borrow. Nah, steal? That's uh, that's pretty bad. Buy? I don't know right now. I don't have the cash. Fabricate? Mm, I don't know. Uh, well, maybe. That's actually a pretty good idea. Otherwise, obtain rubber duck. So I feel like we're going to merge steal and fabricate because I don't really want to steal, but I'm not really taking it if they're saying to take it. So what I did is I went to Google and I just did Lighthouse Larry and came up with some interesting videos. I didn't really look at them, but I did see this first video, or sorry, this first file. Look at what it says. It's an asset for Lighthouse Labs logos. Okay, page one, Larry Larry. I'm gonna click on it. Oh, look at that. It's an Illustrator file. Now, before I open it, I'm gonna go over what we're gonna be using to create a Lottie file. So a Lottie file needs vector, which is basically how we create the mathematical um, design. So it doesn't use rasterization like pixels, um, which would be Photoshop, like an image. So we're gonna need Illustrator. Then we're gonna wanna animate it. So we're gonna need some sort of effect or motion graphics. So we're gonna use After Effects. Now you might be thinking, Matt, I don't got cash for another program. Thankfully, they've got a free trial available for seven days. I'd recommend just signing it up with one of your Gmail accounts, get set up, and we'll start together. Now, if you don't have time, that's okay. I'm going to give you the JSON file once we're done, but this is just to give you an idea of how it's built. So let's go back over to these pages, and this is Illustrator, and this is After Effects. Now, you might be thinking, okay, they're not even using Vector. Like, they're not using any right here. It's video. 
I can tell because it's a bit blurred. If I zoom in, I can, well, actually, actually, if I zoom in, their responsive design will kick in, so I can't do that. But if I did inspect the elements, I can see that it is a video and there is a wrapper and they are using right here a video file, which is MP4. Now, you might be thinking, well, what's the point of using Vector then? Adobe ain't using it. Where are they? What's this? Their logo is an SVG. SVGs are vector formats. Why would they do that? Let's zoom in. Oh, look at that. Adobe's logo looks crystal clear. But their background, ugh, looks just nasty. It looks blurred. Why? It's rasterized because it's a video. It's vector, so it's beautiful and crisp. This is why we want to use vector objects if we can, and we want to understand how they work. Because not only does it look good, it's optimized for all device sizes, and it's not going to increase file size for the user. So you're not going to load a massive image on a mobile device or have to switch between the, the file types just for the user. Because we, we know that there's a lot of different ways that people can view our content. So what do we do to build these? We download the first Illustrator. We download After Effects. Now we're going to also need two plugins. One paid, which is optional, and then one that is free. Lottie Files, we're going to use their After Effects plugin, which is available at lottiefiles.com slash plugins slash After Effects. And we can download their... Uh, their ZXP, or we can just download it through the Adobe Exchange, depending on your preference. This is the one that I'm using to extract the Lottie file into um, LottieFiles.com, or sorry, Lottie animation to LottieFiles.com. And once we've done that, we can use it like I showed you earlier. Now, the Battle Axe is a company that's made another animation workflow, and this workflow is called Overlord. And what they do is they give us the ability to pull all of our assets from Illustrator into After Effects with all of their additional um, attributions. So for example, uh, let's just click the play button and it'll give you a little demonstration. So if we mute this, we've got basically their little animation and it can select the illustration. This is their plugin. It can push all of the layers into after Effects. And when it does that, it also grabs the vector formats. So we can actually control them, keyframe them. Now this might be a little bit over, over your thoughts right now, but they've got swatch controls and all extra stuff. But what we really care about is pulling the graphics into After Effects and that their uh, pivot positions, which is a symbol, I believe, uh, either this one or this one, um, it's basically saying like if we want the pivot to be on the bottom, it stays on the bottom. And that will be useful for when we make um, Larry jump. So now that we've gone over all the programs we're going to use, I know that might have been a much or a bit much, but we'll jump into Larry's um, Illustrator file right here. All right. Now that we've got Larry pulled into our Adobe Illustrator, we're going to go into Window and make sure Layers is checked. And you'll see a area right here on the right hand side called uh, layers that'll give us an indication of everything that's in our illustrator document so we're going to toggle right here now while i'm in illustrator you might see me move around um, i'm using a few combos with my scroll wheel so if i'm moving up and down i'm using my mouse's scroll wheel up and down and if i'm clicking you'll see i'm actually using my scroll wheel as a button and if I click down, it's called middle mouse clicking. And that's how we can actually go left, right, up, down with ease. You'll actually see that the hand turns into like a grip. That's how you kind of have an idea of how I'm navigating. Now, if you see I'm zooming in and out, instead of going down here and typing in my value, I'm just going to hold the alt key on my keyboard and use my scroll wheel while I've clicked in the area. Um, oh, a little bit of lag there. If I'm holding my alt key, It'll allow me to zoom in and zoom out. A oh, little bit of lag, but you get the idea. So we're going to zoom in, um, and we got a, a version with Larry with the uh, keyboard and without the keyboard. So to make it easier, we're just going to select this uh, left version and delete it. Now, 
Before we select, we should go over the selection tools. At the top left, we have a object selection tool, and then we have a direct selection tool. If I select anything with the object selection tool, if I go and use the direct selection tool, it'll go into every single element that is inside that object. So even though it's layer one, it'll allow me to select, for example, Larry. Um, as I select things, on the right hand side you see this uh, indicator, there's a um, blue box, and the box will basically provide you information on what your, your mouse is actually clicked on. So we're going to go and we're going to click on the, um, the direct selection tool, and we're going to select, we're going to select the entire left Larry, and press delete. And you'll see that the layers have gotten a lot cleaner. So one option now is to name our paths. Uh, it's not the best design to actually name paths um, nothing. Um, not to say anything against this designer. The designer that did this is beautiful work. Um, but in a sense of Lottie files, it's not the best in the path. Um, the designer was producing a graphic, so they didn't need to worry about the path names. But in our case, because it's going to be exporting the paths in the file, um, we want to probably indicate what they are. So right here, we've got a flotation device. We've got a keyboard. We've got Larry. So why don't we start with uh, the body? So we've got Larry body. And if we hide that, we can see that that's Larry's body. Um, if we hide this, we see it's uh, Larry's shadow. And uh, let's see, we can hide the shadow and we can see that that was the shadow. Why don't we go and click all the shadows? So I'm going to zoom in. Click on that, hold shift, click on that, and then hold shift, and then click on that. And we have three boxes here. They're all indicating that those are what we selected. So I can click in here, type, uh, let's do left eye shadow, right eye shadow, and down here, I don't know if this is a nose, but I'm going to say nose, or beak, 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 uh, beak shadow. Don't know if I typed that right, but we'll find out later. Uh, let's see, so we got the nose right here, or I guess beak again, beak. And then we are going to go with the eyes. And let's see, we're selecting right here. So we're going to check this is the left. Yep. And we're going to go with left eye, right eye. Oh, and if you double click, it'll pop up that box. Um, and then we've got the left pupil and the right pupil. All right, now we've got highlights. So let's hide these uh, objects for a moment just so we can make sure we're getting everything. So we've got this highlight right here. So highlight one, highlight two, and we can hide those for now. And let's see, we just have these remaining paths to locate. So we can just select them, bring stuff back. And what are we selecting? If I click on this, what does it grab? It grabs the shadow. If I click on this, what does it grab? It grabs the highlight. Flotation, highlight, one. How about this one? Flotation highlight two. All right. And I'm guessing this is the flotation's eye. Yeah. And this is the flotation. This is the keyboard. <coughs> now, the keyboard is where we get into some interesting aspects. When we're working with a vector, we want to limit our paths. We want to avoid having a lot of layers because what this means is a larger file. 
how can we make this object still the way it is without all these paths? We could say try to grab all the paths themselves, which is right here. Um, actually, let me just hide these two so you have a better understanding. If I hide the bottom, all of these objects, you see how I highlight all of them? Every single one of these is a key, except the bottom two which are highlighted because for some reason it grabbed the selection even though they're hidden. And if I go like this, it seems to still grab them. I'm not sure why. Um, but the problem is that we don't want to make all these boxes. It's just too much resources. How can we make this work? Well, what do we have below it? We've got a graphic that is literally just one color. And this is all just the same color too. It's the same color as the background. So why don't we take this and drag it all the way up. I'll just drop it here for a bit because my scroll wheel won't let me keep on going. Thankfully it's highlighted so we know where it is out of all of it. We're going to drag it all the way up right to the top. Awesome. Now we've got this and this. Now you're like, okay, what about the keys? You've just destroyed the whole keyboard. Well, we've got all the paths that are just below it. And we're going to select all of these. And let's see, I think if we... I don't know if we have to do this individually, but let's just try one for now. We're going to click on Window. Then we're going to go to Pathfinder. Now, what I'd like to do is minus a part of the graphic. So I don't think we're minusing the front. I always miss these up. So it might be minus back, but let's try this out. So we're gonna use the selection tool. We're gonna select the first layer, which is on the top. We're gonna hold shift, then we're gonna select the second one, which is the first key, which is right here. We're gonna try minus back. It worked. We told that path to take that area and delete it from the original graphic. So now what happens if we go and we grab all of these paths, except the bottom one? Now this might not work. It might need me to do it individually. Actually, it doesn't even look like it's selecting them. Let's see if I can just uh, control click, control click, nope. Okay, so we're going to try to do this uh, one by one, but there's a better way. I know there's a better way. Let's just see if we can hide this back one, because we don't need that. We're going to grab all that. I'm going to try it. It seemed to work. But did it delete? It did. It deleted our background. So I'm going to undo one more. And it seemed to work, but... It seemed to select the last path for some reason. So I'm going to hold shift and unselect it by pressing that little blue box. Now, if I press minus back, it's given us our keys. We've got our background. And we have no more paths. All those extra paths are gone. And why do we need a group? We, we've got the keyboard with this. We'll, we'll put it inside the keyboard. So now we can call this this top layer, the keys, and the board. It's a lot cleaner. And the user is going to be a lot happier because that just reduced a lot more file size. Now, like I was saying, the designer didn't need to worry about that because they were producing a vector result. Um, that wouldn't have really been a huge deal. But in our case, it, it does make a big difference. So just keep an eye out for those things if you're working in uh, vector. So if we open up or revisualize all of these elements. We should be on track. Larry is the text. Everything is named. All right. Now, oh, let's name the group too. Larry. Perfect. All right. Now we are ready for moving it into After Effects. So to move it into After Effects, you want to open up After Effects and then create a new composition. And we don't have to worry about the size or any of that stuff. We can change that later. We'll just type in Larry. And now that we've got Larry created, 
Um, I know you might have seen a Flickr. I think it was just uh, perhaps an older version I had in there. Um, and basically, let's pull Larry in. So if we go Window Extension um, Overlord. Overlord is installed on Illustrator and After Effects. And the reason is we're pulling graphics from one program to another. You could likely save this file and just go into After Effects and import it. Now, that might produce it as a single object, like Larry right here. Um, and we don't really want that because then we can't control everything. So, for example, if I, if I grab this, this version of Larry, it's selecting right here. And I go in here and I don't have this set, the split layer uh, shift uh, shapes to all layer. If I didn't have that set, this is what it would most likely pull in if you were to grab the Illustrator file and just drag it into um, After Effects. It would grab, oh, did I select everything? Oh, perhaps I didn't select everything. Maybe I've got the, uh, let's see, grab this, select all, go into After Effects. And then let's see, pull selection from there. There we are. Now it's pulling everything. Um, if I don't have this set, it'll merge everything except the text layer. Um, the text layer, actually, we should fix before we import it too, because that's something we should consider as well. Um, so we're going to delete this. And you see how it's just Larry? We don't have access to the keyboard. We don't have access to the flotation. Um, this just doesn't give us much control for animation. So we're going to delete that too. We're going to click on this symbol right here because it's normally uh, checked. And this one is the center of the anchor points. Um, it's useful. It's, it's going to be good for animation. Um, if we had already set the pivots, it won't matter. But or it would be more useful if we had set the pivots. But right now it won't matter. But like I was mentioning, the text. The text is a problem. We do not have control over text in vector. Like we do and we don't. Text is not really necessarily vector. It's still editable. So to make this a vector format, we have to go to object and I believe it's expand appearance. Normally I think it was just expand, but let's just see. Yeah, expand. And then, okay. And what this should have done is you see how it's no longer a text object. It's telling us the paths. It's, it's showing us every little indicator of the path points. And this is what it's done. It's turned the text into vector. And now, if we were to look at the graphic, each letter is a vector path. So we'll put this as L. This is A. R. R. Y. And we'll put the period. And we'll put uh, Larry. <coughs> now, you might be thinking, hey, I've got two R's. That's that's redundant. Well, you kind of need two R's. So don't worry about that. Um, because if you took one out, you'd, you'd have uh, Larry. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go back and zoom out. Uh, and then we click on here on the full selection object. Select all of the entirety of it. Jump back into Illustrator. Now that we've got split shapes into layers and we pull it, we should see every individual layer pulled with their names in the right order, all controllable. And keep in mind the speed is based on your computer. And just like that, we can see on the left-hand side, the stars are indicating that every single layer that we pulled in is a vector object, which is perfect because that's what we're looking for. Now, let's just wonder, what can we do with this that's nothing too complicated? Because, you know, we're not animators. We're just trying to have some fun. Uh, let's go and take the entirety of Larry and try to play around with him a bit. So... Let's see, we want to animate 
just the body. And if we were to use a minute of animation, how much time do you think we would really want to animate um, the body going up and down? And sorry, the shadow actually right here, probably pull that all the way down to the bottom. Just good to have the, the layers in order of how you would expect them. And because we're not gonna really animate the shadow yet, I'm gonna press this little lock key. And another thing to play around with is we don't wanna to have to animate every single element. This is a lot of different elements to animate. We don't want to have keyframes for every single thing. Um, but actually with a lot of files, you kind of do. You, you want to animate everything, but you don't want to make it overly complicated. You don't want to have like every single element having keyframes. So what you can do is you can parent. So we have Larry's body right here. So I'm going to take every object. Now we might disable the keyboard and the flotation after, but for now we're gonna take every object and we're gonna grab this uh, parent pick whip and we're gonna drag it to Larry's body. And it set every object to Larry's body. Now we can grab Larry's body and we can move it. And everything moves with it. We don't have to worry about animating everything. So now that we've got that in place, we're gonna click on this little toggle here. And this toggle gives us control of a lot of parameters. It looks little, but it's a lot. Transform. Transform is basically our up, down, left, right, uh, rotation, anchor points and such. The anchor point, like I was mentioning about, will be nice for, in animation, they have a squash and stretch. So when we want Larry to bounce, we want him to kind of squish. And we want that anchor point of his squish point to be at his bottom. So to readjust the anchor point, if I drag this, you'll see that that little spot that it's actually um, got the little uh, cur or like a, um, sorry, it's like a cross -hire. If we make that go straight to the bottom of Larry, right there. And then we control the position and we move it just down to about here. That basically gives us full control of where the squish is going to be coming from. So when we hit the bottom, it's not squishing from the center. It's squishing from the bottom, which is what we want. Now, we want to also keyframe the animation for now. But we'll figure out how to do more with the, the keyframes after. But for now, we just want to make it simple. So we're going to click on this position, this little um, stopwatch. We're going to click on that. And you'll see that there's a little dot here or a little uh, keyframe indicator that just popped up. If yours popped up somewhere else, it's because your timeline was probably grabbed at wherever it was and that's where the dot was. So if I go say 10 frames in right here, now this is at 30 frames per second. So keep in mind the time is a little bit different. This is probably like 10 or sorry, 24 frames per second. So you, we have to consider the frames per second as well if we're considering like, is this 10 seconds or 10 frames? Um, but for now, we're just going to work with the frames. We're going to go to 10 frames, click on this, and we're going to move uh, the duck down to hit this little uh, shadow. And let's just see what happens if we scroll back. It goes from down to up. Now, why don't we just take this frame right here on the left, press control C, or if you're on a Mac, I think it's command C. Uh, and then we go over to frame 20 and then we paste. All right. Now what will happen if we want to press uh, our space bar? It loads all of the keyframes. You see the green that loaded, that's our preload. And that just says render basically everything that we've made. And then if we press the spacebar again, it shows it bounce. Okay, looks kind of cheesy. It's okay, it's a good start, right? Now, we also want it a bit lower because of the height of Larry, but we're getting there. So if we scroll down and we find that middle point right here, let's just press space again. And we can also press up here in preview. It uh, shows it right here. I've just got spacebar as the shortcut. If we want to make it a little bit more bouncy, 
let's see if we go here. Why don't we copy this keyframe? We'll paste it around seven. Then I will paste it around 13. And then on frame 10, we're going to squish them. We're going to squish it a little bit more. Now, you don't want to change the position. Don't want to change the anchor point. You want to change the scale. But we don't want this lock here because it's going to constrain the properties, meaning we want everything to go from 100% down. So when we uncheck it, it's not going to change the width. It's only going to change the height. And if we go up, it's bigger. If we go down, it's smaller. So why don't we go, let's say about, we kind of want it to look funny too, because he's a funny duck. And we're going to go 80. And maybe we do want to actually squash and stretch, because that is the principle. You do want to squish, and as you squish, it expands. So let's go maybe 120. <laughs> now, keep in mind, the everything is being squished and squashed. So we might need to be aware of how this looks. This might not be, this might be extreme. Oh, interesting. What's happened? He's not changing in the style that we want him to change. Now, you might be thinking, well, what, what happened? Everything was the way you said. We made a mistake and we didn't click this simple time button. What we did is we set the scale globally. So if we click this scale right here, we'll see that the timeline shows a secondary icon and that's under scale. So if we now go here and we set this back to 100 and this to 100 and then we copy this keyframe and paste it here, this should give us the result we're looking for. It's getting better. Not bad. So what else can we do with this? Well, if we've got this as an animation for him just bouncing, what about the shadow? Why don't we make the shadow change as well? So if we go and we go a little bit lower to the shadow, how do we do that? How do we make it simulate the same effect? Well, why don't we just copy the scale and go into shadow? Oh, uncheck that little lock. Scroll down, open up transform, go to scale, click on scale, and let's just press paste. Looks like it's a little bit off because we moved our timeline, but we can drag it and let's see what that looks like. Not too shabby. Now, I think that that's somewhat unrealistic of what we would see though. I think we would also see it small, uh, get smaller. So what I would do is around here at 90 frames, we should also probably have it have a hundred percent uh, as zero frame uh, state. So we'll click at the beginning, click on a little indicator, click on the 24 frames, click on the indicator. Now we could go all the way to the minute. I just chose 24, for example. Um, I think I was trying to do symmetry there because there's uh, four blocks here and four blocks here. Um, and then basically if we take these points and we leave them as the normal state, but around seven is where he started to go down, right? He started to actually get um, to the point where he's already hit the ground. Now, we don't really think that this state is a problem. We find that the outer states are a problem. So we should go and maybe make it smaller as it goes higher up, right? So if we go here and change it to 80. Now, if we press space, that's looking a bit more realistic. All right. Now, now that we've got them bouncing, is there anything that we can do to make sure that we know that there's a code problem? So, for example, I want him to bounce, but I want him to pull the keyboard out if there's a state. So I don't really want him to have the keyboard in the first, base, uh, first part. I'm going to take the keyboard and I'm going to take this part of the timeline and I'm going to cut it all the way over to here. Now you're like, well, what did that do? Well, let's press space. He's got no keyboard until the very end. So 
What are we going to do with that? I'm going to go from here, from frame 27, or sorry, I think it was actually 21, or 21, I guess. I kept referring to 24, but it's 20, uh, 21. Um, we're going to take everything but the keyboard and lock it. So we're going to drag this all the way down. And uncheck these. Because right now we're just interested in animating the keyboard. We'll open up the transform of the keyboard. We'll take the scale and we'll go up to 20, uh, 22. And we are going to create a point of what it's at first, because you never want to really animate what it was at. Uh, it's, it's, it's easier to work with what you have than to try to recreate it after. Um, now I also need more frames. So I'm going to go to composition, uh, composition settings. And for the duration, I'm going to change it to, let's say a minute and 20. And now I should have more frames. Oh, I might have already had frames right here. I've got the timeline end. So if I click on here and I drag it, I actually already had a bunch of frames. That's okay. So I'm going to extend this to about here. And we'll have to do the same with all the others, but we'll worry about that after because the duck's going to disappear once we get past one minute. Um, but to set those states, we're going to click the position, the scale, rotation, opacity. And this will calculate all of those. We're going to go up to the end point. We're going to check all of these. And we're going to actually make it so that, oh, actually, I think I did that the opposite way. We want to have this in the center as the point of like where he has the keyboard. I keep misclicking these. There we go. And we want to make it so it animates up to that point. And the reason I'm having two of them is because we kind of want a central state where he's holding the keyboard up normally. And we want it to, to stay in that state. So now we have this. We're going to set it to, well, maybe, maybe we don't even need to hide the opacity. We'll leave that there for now. Um, we will click all of these just so it sets the states. We're going to leave the um, constraint proportions on this time. We're going to drop the size of the keyboard. And we're going to rotate it. And then we are going to move its position down. And it looks like the flotation device actually has some opacity. <coughs> so we'll drop the opacity on this too. And we're going to move it up a little bit more actually. Oop, this way. Perfect. So now what will happen is it should spin out and then it will just disappear. Let's see. Okay, that does not look good at all, but that's because we can't see the duck in any regard. So let's see, we'll hide these. And we're going to grab all of the elements and extend them. And now we should be able to test what that is looking like. Now let's press space, it's bouncing, hits the keyboard. Now we don't want it to end like this, so we're gonna cut it right there. That'll basically see. Now, right here is also our preview point, so why don't we just cut it to this point where we can just see what the keyboard is looking like. So if I press space again, oh, it's, uh, it's because I'm actually using the range. Should be work area, I believe. So if I space bar now, it's only showing this. Okay. So why don't we see what happens if I delete these keyframes? I think what's happening is we're trying to animate too quickly within the too short of a span. 
So there is the kind of animation we're trying to go for. Um, we want to have everything a lot longer though. So I suspect that the keyframes duration is the problem that we're experiencing right now. So if I select all of these and expand it to, let's just go straight to the end. And that's good enough. Then we expand this here. Oops. We don't want to drag the whole thing. We just want to expand. And then we want to take the duration end down to about here. And we will check it again, pressing space. And it expanded the cache. And now we've got the little keyboard popping up. Um, it's not the smoothest effect. I'm not really a fan of the, um, the fade that it's got. So I'm thinking of just taking out everything but the rotation and the fade. So I'm just going to uncheck opacity and uncheck scale. And let's just see what it looks like if we go like this. And then I'm going to move this position up a bit. So Larry will always have his keyboard. It'll just be sitting at his side. And then, oh, he's got something to talk about. So let's figure out the pivot point or the anchor point. Right now its anchor point is on the center. Let's make that right at the other spot. So I think right here is also, oh, that should be an anchor point control. And I'm surprised I'm not actually seeing it in this HUD because I thought it was this, but I'm suspecting I'm wrong on that regard. Um, so we'll just do it right here. We'll control the anchor point by moving it up here. And let's see, oh, for some reason it's moving both areas. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of inverted. Interesting. I wonder if I can just click it. Nope. It's animating it. That's what's going on. Interesting. Is there an anchor point controller? Not that I recall either. Hmm. Well, we'll work with the way we can. I'm going to move this all the way here. And then move that that way. And now I've got the anchor point kind of where I want it. Oh, it seems to still take that. Interesting. So I was thinking that it would actually move it backwards and forwards when I transformed, but it does not want to do that. This is okay. This is actually uh, close to what I was hoping for. Because what I can have it do is pivot at this point, and then we'll move it back this way. And he'll have it under his hand. And if you can get this to click, oh, other way. We have Larry has his keyboard at his side. And then when it gets up to here, Larry's keyboard flies off to the other area, but we want to make sure it's the same position right here. Oh. So it's 155.9. And if we go back to 10 and we paste that position in, It'll set it back to where it was originally, but it'll be rotated at the position that we kind of want. Um, now for the rotation, it might be quite high. Um, I'm not sure if that was the original height, though, that we had either. So let me just go back here, and I'll take the position. No, no, because I think we set the original height there. That was what Larry had. 
So maybe this, this is kind of what I was hoping for, but now it's kind of static. It just hits the edge. It's not really fluid. So what we can do is we can copy, um, we can either do two things. We can copy these frames and make it ease in or ease out, or we can just right click them and do keyframe assistance and do easy in and do easy in. And now if we hit space, it should do it uh, a pre cache. And now it smooths in. It just goes a little bit smoother. We can do the same with our bounce, um, but I think we did a pretty good job with that. So I don't think it's a huge necessity um, to, to add, but or necessity to add, but we could use it if we wanted. Um, now if we go and see our entire animation, we've got this. So now I think Larry should have his keyboard at all times. But he'll have it at a side. Now we've got a little animation. So we have a two state animation now. We can have it where Larry is just continuously bouncing. And if there's a bug, it'll pop out his keyboard. So this is a good example of what we could start with. Now we want to have it set to his size. So we're going to go to the composition size. And why don't we just go into Illustrator and see what they use? So we've got, let's see, if we just take a box and we go right over Larry, we've got 250 by three, let's say 345. So we'll go 250 width and we'll go 345 for the height. All right, now we're gonna have to find a way to position Larry into the center. Now, I'm wondering if there's an easier way. I think there is, because everything is in a composition. I feel like we should be able to just align this, but we might have to play around with some of the animation before this. Uh, let's see. So I think there might be a way to do the composition where it centers the object. Nope, not there. Aspect. No, I don't see it there. That's okay. We'll just take everything, select all, drag it over and see if it breaks. I'm not sure if it's just my computer slow or if we've unlocked. Oh, we did not grab Larry's body. Okay. We probably actually, all we really did actually have to do is grab Larry's body. My only concern is it's going to track the position as a placement. So we should probably just do it through the keyframes. We will go from here and we will move its uh, left position right about here. And we'll probably make this a little bit bigger, actually. I'm going to not prefer it to be this close to his body. So let's go composition size, and we'll go 350. Now, actually, we have a moment where we could actually control it to be perfect. So why don't we just do it square, 350 by 350. That way, the aspect ratio is exactly one to one and the scaling shouldn't be any concern. Um, and then let's see, before we adjust this, I feel like we could undo a few of these things. So I'm gonna undo to get Larry back to the point where he was over here. Unfortunately, it's counting every little individual movement. There we are. Redo one. Oh, right, there we are. We want to take the shadow and link it to Larry's body too. Just so when we move the body, we can move everything. 
Um, and now we want to move the position for Larry's body. We're going to go all the way to the beginning. <clears throat> and then we're going to change the scale and move it all the way up here. And this way, everything's moving with us. Except the anchor point, which seems to be a bit of a concern, but we'll fix that in a bit. And like we did before, we go into the composition size, set it to 1 to 1 by 350. And now we can play with the position a little bit more and drop it. Okay. So now if we hit space, it might move it over to the left. That's okay. We're going to work with that. So when we get up to here, that's the base. And this is the base. And this is the height. Now the shadow is breaking because we've actually got it assigned to Larry. You know what? Let's just undo because I know there's another way to do this. I'm going to undo because I don't think we need to readjust all these things. Because we've already spent all this time animating it perfectly as we wanted. And then we reset the composition. So what we need to do is trim comp to work area. Oh, did that not do it? Work area, trim comp to work area. This is the composition size to work area. So what if we do, um, I'll pause and I'll find this answer because I know this is a lot easier than it looks. All right, so I found out that there is a amazing tool called Crop Region of Interest, and it's this box right down here. So if I click on this, I can now create the crop size and I can press space, see if it hits within the space, which it isn't. So I'm going to actually increase this crop size. I'm going to bring this up all the way up to here. Um, I think I can actually make it go a little bit higher. So if I go like this, it goes within the crop size. Now I can make Larry's body not go that high. So if I go, where was it? I think uh, right here. Let's set his position to 280. Nope, nope, it's got to be higher then. Uh, let's go to 95. We're going to go 350. Nope, not going that high. Uh, we are going to 300. There we are, right to the top. Perfect. Now if we go to the beginning, we want to put that at 300 as well. Perfect. Now Larry's inside the area. So now we go to composition, crop composition to region of interest. And there we now have Larry set in the composition. We hit space. He pulls out his keyboard and we're all set. Now I could animate the keyboard back in for time sensitivity. I'm just going to leave it as is. We can always freeze the state at this point. Um, but this is where we're at the point where we want to export Larry. So I'm just going to save Larry just before Larry. And now that we've got Larry, we're going to go to Windows, Extensions, and Lottie Files. Now that we've got Lottie Files open, it's going to ask us to log in. So it's going to ask us to click on their login tool. Um, I've already got an account with Lottie Files, so it's going to open up in my browser Ask me, do I grant permission? I've already accessed it. It's giving me access. And now I can see all of my past um, progress on tests um, that I've done with uh, Lottie files. Um, I think right here it's pulling in Larry and it's showing me right here. I can preview it. So I'm just going to render it. And it's taking in our animation and it's seeing if everything that we've done really will work. And this is what it will work. It'll look like if we save the file. So if I go save as, I now have a Lottie JSON file. So I can take this Lottie JSON file and I can just say Larry. Um, now in the sense of making it easier for people, 
I'm just going to upload and it'll upload to my uh, Lottie file library and I'll make sure that only those that uh, have access to this will be able to access it. Um, so right here we've got the public, let's see if I go share. So I'm just going to make sure that if I go in here, we have right here our Lottie file. And we're going to go Lighthouse Labs Larry. Oh, did I miss the Y? Ah, it's not letting me type Larry. I'm going to take it to LHL Larry. Awesome. So uh, we could turn it to night mode, day mode. And it works. If I wanted to hand it off, I can convert it to a GIF. Don't do that. <laughs> I can edit the animation. I can change the uh, bounty box, the transparency. I can even send you guys it as a QR code. So scan this if you want it. <laughs> um, but realistically, um, we should be able to go to lottiefiles.com now. And let me just see if it actually did go into my account. Uh, so my public animations shouldn't show anything public. Private animations might have a few in there that I was tinkering with. Um, and here it is. We've got Larry. So I will not publish this publicly, but if you want to use Larry, this is the link that you will use. So I'm going to make this nice and large. And you'll see that he's crystal clear, bouncing away. You can scan this. You can copy this or you can copy this. And if you want to use it, you just go in here. And if you wanted to animate them, um, you would just go into any Lottie file. So say I go to discover free animations and then I click on this one. Um, and then I say I wanted to embed it as HTML or interactivity, for example. So it starts it off with this. I could just replace this URL. It should update it. And here we are. You've got all of the controls, all of the animations that you can do. Animate on scroll, um, scroll relative to container. It's one to one, so your container size is a relation, right? Um, so keep in mind your container, you'll want to put it at a certain size. Offset, um, scroll on offset. And we've got the little bouncing. Um, play on segments. So this is where we would set the um, limits. So we could set it to the bounce and it doesn't do anything else but bounce. Um, play on segments on hover. So if we hover it, then it starts to do these effects. Um, sync animation with cursor. So like as I go up and down or left and right, if we click it, if we play on hover, we toggle. So I've clicked it and then I click it again. I'm not too shabby. And play uh, when visible. So it's visible now. Uh, play on hold, put the mouse over it, and then I let go of it. Reverses. Uh, let's see, play on animation when it hold. Same thing, pause when it's, or when it's not released. And then clicking on activity won't work because we don't have any states that are actually set up. But this is how you can build your own Lottie animations. And I hope this is insightful and helpful because I found it very useful when I learned it. And after I understood how to build these animations, I felt this was something that I could build for any of my projects and showcase their, their design, their layouts, their um, ideas, knowing that mobile visitors aren't feeling the blunt load time of heavy graphics or videos. So keep in mind, if you want to show a simple phone um, sliding to a different uh, modal or a different effect, you can make these Lottie animations. And uh, now you have the tools that are fully equipping you to do so. I hope this is helpful. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out anytime. Have a great day.